This is the eighth and final in our graphics series. In this one here, we're going to look at uh, a few pieces of advice, I suppose, in terms of summary by way of linking together a number of the different areas that we've considered uh, to date. So we'll start off first of all with uh, some practical advice for loading in and storing images. Uh, now we're talking about images here, equally it applies to other forms of asset, like for example sound clips or other related items. So when we load something in, let's say a graphic image, I guess they'll be stored on the device's uh, RAM. And if it's something we're going to draw, and quite often a lot of devices there's, there's a dedicated piece of RAM set aside for the video cards or VRAM. Now that often is quite a lot faster than normal RAM or it may be uh, set aside and very close to, uh, in terms of uh, access speed to the, the video hardware. And most devices will, will have this here. But long and short, when we load something in from disk or from a memory card or wherever we've got the thing stored, it's going to end up in some portion of RAM. So our CPU will fire off a read request or load request and we'll pull this in from whatever longer term storage we have on the device. Uh, now this could be built in memory store on the device, it could be pulling across a network connection, it could be streaming it off solid state drive, it doesn't really matter but generally speaking it has to be taken in, loaded in to memory. And then it resides in memory or depending on what we've loaded in, it might be within video RAM as well. Once we've loaded it in and we draw it, then um, quite a lot of devices, there's a separate piece of silicon which will end up drawing it and we send a request off to that to draw. And effectively there, that piece of uh, silicon will be copying the data from memory to another bit of memory, uh, which happens to be um, replicating then what is displayed on the, the screen. So that's the type of process that we, um, we go through. Images are actually quite memory intensive. So on, when they're stored on, on disk or river, they're compressed. Quite often they're very heavily compressed. But whenever we load them into memory, uh, if they're stored in an uncompressed format, they actually take up quite a surprisingly large amount of space. This can be an issue on devices. And it means when we're actually creating games, we're in the process of more often reusing uh, a smaller subset of images, piecing them together to draw a scene overall. So you've got an example here if you look at the, the image on this screen, where you can see that, for example, for the platforms, for the pillars, for the different uh, decorative elements that are drawn, they're all from a common subset. So there, there's a small number of images that were loaded in that were drawn repeatedly to build up that image. Now, having said that we are repeatedly drawing the images, it gives rise, there's a need to have something to manage this process. And quite often that's known as an asset manager. So the job of the asset manager is to, not only to load in, but to store, to manage all of the different assets, the images and indeed the signs and other things that we have going in to the game. One of the key jobs of the asset manager is to share these things out. So what we definitely want to avoid is that if you look at, for example, our image here, uh, we might have a number of, um, let's say, uh, cherries or strawberries or whatever they are, the collectibles. So these are instances of objects that we are creating. We definitely do not want to get into a position where each instance of those objects loads in its own copy of exactly the same image. That would be very wasteful. So instead, our asset manager loads in one instance and stores it, and our game objects then go to the asset manager and asks to borrow a reference or a pointer to that so they can then draw it out. Obviously, it's a read-only access then because I don't like to change it normally, but this gives us a way of reading in, storing it once, but then sharing it across a wider number of objects. If you want to get more fancy forms of asset manager, you can get into ones that can dynamically load or unload the data. So for example, as you're um, getting towards the end of a level or a checkpoint, you might be automatically loading in details or information for the, the next one. So you can, again, have things going into memory, going out of memory. In terms of practical advice then about drawing out our game world, so we've mentioned here that it's important, uh, well, depending on the game, um, to, to convey a sense of perspective or to, to draw things in a consistent order. Uh, 
so that the game looks mm, consistent the way it's meant to be. And the, the picture over on the right hand side is one we've seen before where we were able to break up our scene into a number of different layers and we had to be careful in making sure we were drawing those layers in the right order to piece together uh, in the intended scene that we wanted to have. The layers that we're drawing, uh, so they may fit on the screen, but sometimes they may be conceptually larger than the screen. So for example, you may, and quite often you do have a game layer, which we think of as being bigger than the visible screen and uh, may, for example, contain a wide number of different objects. Some other layers could be the same size or, or you know, quite often the same size or maybe slightly bigger. So for example, here we've got a background layer, which doesn't contain any game objects, only contains, in this case, an image ribbon, which we use for the background. For drawing these out then, we effectively draw our background ribbon, we draw whatever game objects fall within the viewport, and by compositing those two things, we end up with our game overall, or game scene. Um, in splitting up this way, it's important then to realise that there's a relationship between the layers. That if our game layer scrolls or moves by 10 units, then there's likely to be some corresponding movement in our background layer. And depending on if we're trying to do parallax effects or other related things, it could be 10, it could be less than 10, it could be none if it's just there and it's a static background. It doesn't move. The idea that we can have quite a large level with lots and lots of different types of objects gives, no, uh, gives rise to the notion of the viewport that some things will be visible and some things will not be visible. So if we had, a, in this case, a large tile-based environment, and this is our screen, the viewport, the things that are visible, there's no point trying to draw all of the other tiles. There's no point going, for example, to one up in the top left and trying to draw that out, when because it's outside of the visible screen, it's just going to be wasted effort. So for games that do have a large notional level and a small window, a small viewport into it, they generally spend a bit of effort going through the objects, working out which ones are visible, which ones are not visible, and only drawing the things that fall within the, the viewport. Here's, there's simple ways of doing this, there's fancy ways of doing it. Uh, SG gets into what's known as scene graphs, and there's quite a few scene graphs that can, hand, can have tens of thousands of objects and, and give you quite powerful, efficient ways of parsing through which ones are, are visible or not visible. If you think now about drawing these things out, how we draw them out to the, the screen. We can either work with the hardware that we have on the device uh, and make it run as fast and efficiently as it can, or we can structure things in a way that's going to cause it to struggle. And this comes into how GPUs more or less work at the minute. That they are remarkably fast, they have very high throughputs. But any time you send a request into the GPU, there is a degree of setup, a configuration cost that's associated with it. And ideally, we want to, man to minimize uh, that uh, configuration cost. It's fairly simple to do this. And the best way to do it is that if I want to draw out a lot of things, well, then I pick one image at a time and I draw out all instances of that image. And then I go on to the next image and draw out all instances of that image. So you can see here where we had six instances of our blue circle and four of our yellow circle. We have one setup for the blue image. We draw it six times. Then we have one setup for the uh, yellow image and we draw that four times. So it's, it's batching, they're being batched together. Conversely, the one at the bottom is very poor performance where we, we set it up for drawing one image, we draw it out, then we ask the GPU to set itself up again to draw another image, and then we change back to the first one. So there the overhead associated with that is likely uh, to be considerably um, higher. There are some hints and other things you can do about it, and quite often um, if you have one large image with multiple images on that, that's quite fast and efficient because there you only have the image stored once, but you're drawing different regions from it, and that, that generally is a low overhead on the, the GPU. So advice in this, um, have a clear vision of how you want your game to look. Be able to see it in your mind's eye. Depending on the game, work out if that then separates into a number of different layers or elements within the, the game. 
and what, if that is the case, what is to be displayed in each of those layers. So think about and depose, de uh, decompose your game using that particular mechanism. That'll help uh, take a big, complex problem and break it down into a number of smaller, more manageable parts. So summary of steps then. So in your game design, you should consider the following separate but de uh, dependent processes. So all of these can be implemented on their own, but they all have links into other processes on it. Uh, so it's important to, to try to think about it independently, but also to think about how it links in with other processes. So our first one then is loading in the graphics from whatever uh, location the graphics are stored. So what graphics need to be loaded? In what order? All at once or in different phases? And again, we're talking about graphics here, really any asset sounds as well. And the types of things you might have here is that initially you, you load in a few graphics, just enough to get a splash screen up in the, the, uh, the visible in the screen. Then you load in more graphics. If you're finding that's taking long, you might want to just load in the main menu graphics and then have a, another splash screen when you're loading in the first level, for example. Question two, are higher assets managed? At a bare minimum, we want to have a mechanism of loading things in and then sharing those out with the different game instances. If there's a need and if you wanted to, you could get fancy in terms of dynamic loading and streaming and things like that. Question thereafter then is, okay, we're gonna have a bunch of different game objects and our game objects are likely to want access to the graphics, the assets that we've loaded in. So we've got to give them a mechanism whereby they can access the assets. Different ways of doing that, and we'll, we'll look at some later on, uh, either in terms of, of passing in uh, an, a, a link, a reference to the asset manager through the constructor, or having ways of being able to call it through the, for example, the parent layer. That's more about construction and giving access if we're thinking then about drawing, so we're assuming here that our game, we can think about it comprising a number of layers, those layers containing a number of game objects. So first question there is, what layers need to be drawn and also in what order? When we pick a layer, we need to ask, okay, is this layer bigger than our visible screen? If so, which objects within that layer ought we to be uh, drawing at this point and which ones are not going to be visible? We can pass that through and that will give us then, uh, if you like, a set of visible objects. Having defined then a set of visible objects, the next thing after that is to work out which order should we be drawing those objects in to make sure we have consistent depth and scene and things like that. Now, depending on how many layers we have, there may be no ordering at all. If all of these things notionally are at the same depth and we have layers as a way of managing the depth complexity, then this is a, a, a non-stage. Whereas if we put a lot of things into our, our game layer and some of them are more forward or behind other ones, then we will want to look at them and to consider how we do ordering. Final phase after that is simply to work out how do we actually draw each object. And quite often that's a devolved or decomposed element to get the object to draw itself. In some cases, maybe it's just an image. In other cases, um, it's, it's a tiled image or maybe it's an animation in terms of picking the, the right phase. But there it does come down to an object by object account. And that's really it in terms of the, the key uh, elements or phases that we should be bearing in mind when we're thinking about drawing out our game. Takeaways on this uh, three-ish of them. So very, very important. Have a clear vision of how you want your game to look. That really is important by way of helping to direct and to guide your development. Try to model the game uh, in terms of game objects, in terms of layers, in terms of other things. Again, that helps you decompose to break down complexity into something that's more simple, more manageable. For each layer that you have that's visible, work out which objects need to be drawn within that layer, which are visible. Think about the order in which they need to be drawn, if that is important. And then how are you going to draw each of those objects individually? And by breaking it up and doing each of those, you can take quite a complex idea and have different elements which will all come together to produce your final overall game.